the Cambridge Capital Controversy, sometimes called the Capital Controversy, or the Two Cambridges Debate, refers to a theoretical and mathematical debate during the 1960s among economists concerning the nature and role of capital goods and the critique of the dominant neoclassical vision of aggregate production and distribution. The name arises because of the location of the principles involved in the controversy. The debate was largely between economists such as Joan Robinson and Piero Raffa at the University of Cambridge in England and economists such as Paul Samuelson and Robert Solo at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The two schools are often labelled Sraffian or Neo-Ricardian and Neoclassical, respectively. Most of the debate is mathematical, but some major elements can be explained in simple terms and as part of the aggregation problem. That is, the critique of neoclassical capital theory might be summed up as saying that it suffers from the fallacy of composition, i.e., that we cannot simply jump from microeconomic conceptions to an understanding of production by society as a whole. The resolution of the debate, particularly how broad its implications are, has not been agreed upon by economists. Ideological issues. Much of the emotion behind the debate arose because the technical criticisms of marginal productivity theory were connected to wide arguments with ideological implications. The famous neoclassical economist John Bates Clark saw the equilibrium rate of profit as a market price determined by technology and the relative proportions in which the factors of production are used in production. Just his wages of the reward for the labor that workers do, profits of the reward for the productive contributions of capital. Thus, the normal operations of the system under competitive conditions pay profits to the owners of capital, responding to the indictment that hangs over society, that it involves exploiting labor. Clark wrote, It is the purpose of this work to show that the distribution of the income of society is controlled by a natural law, and that this law, if it worked without friction, would give to every agent of production the amount of wealth which that agent creates. However wages may be adjusted by bargains freely made between individual men, the rates of pay that result from such transactions tend, it is here claimed, to equal the part of the product of industry which is traceable to the labor itself, and however interest may be adjusted by similarly free bargaining, it naturally tends to equal the fractional product that is separately traceable to capital. These profits are in turn seen as rewards for saving i.e. abstinence from current consumption, which led to the creation of the capital goods. Thus, in this view, profit income is a reward for those who value future income highly and thus willing to sacrifice current enjoyment. Strictly speaking, however, modern neoclassical theory does not say that capital's and labor's income is deserved in some moral or normative sense. Sense. But despite ostensible efforts to separate normative from positive economics, the normative tone appears in many economic works anyway. Some members of the Marxian school argue that even if the means of production earned a return based on the marginal product, that does not imply that their owners created the marginal product and should be rewarded. In the Sraffian view, the rate of profit is not a price, and it is not clear that it is determined in a market. In particular, it only partially reflects the scarcity of the means of production relative to the demand. While the prices of different types of means of production are prices, the rate of profit can be seen in Marx in terms, as reflecting the social and economic power that owning the means of production gives this minority to exploit the majority of workers and to receive profit. But not all followers of Sraffer interpret his theory of production and capital in this Marxian way. 
nor do all Marxists embrace the Sraffian model. In fact, such authors as Michael Lebowitz and Frank Roosevelt are highly critical of Sraffian interpretations, except as a narrow technical critique of the neoclassical view. There are also Marx and economists like Michael Albert and Robin Harnell, who consider the Sraffian theory of prices, wages and profit to be superior to Marx's own theory. The rest of this article concerns only technical issues, standpoints. Naturally enough the two contending schools arrive at different conclusions concerning this debate. It is useful to quote some of these. Sraffian views Here are some of the Cambridge critics' views. Capital reversing renders meaningless the neoclassical concepts of input substitution and capital scarcity a labor scarcity. It puts in jeopardy the neoclassical theory of capital and the notion of input demand curves both at the economy and industry levels. It also puts in jeopardy the neoclassical theories of output and employment determination as well as Wixellian monetary theories, since they are all deprived of stability. The consequences for neoclassical analysis are thus quite devastating. It is usually asserted that only aggregate neoclassical theory of the textbook variety, and hence macroeconomic theory, based on aggregate production functions, is affected by capital reversing. It has been pointed out, however, that when neoclassical general equilibrium models are extended to long-run equilibria, stability proofs require the exclusion of capital reversing. In that sense, all neoclassical production models would be affected by capital reversing. These findings destroy, for example, the general validity of Heckscher Olin Samuelson International Trade Theory, of the Hicksian neutrality of technical progress concept, of neoclassical tax incidence theory, and of the Pigouvian taxation theory applied in environmental economics. Neoclassical Views. The neoclassical economist Christopher Bliss comments, quote, dot, dot, What one might call the existential aspect of capital theory has not attracted much interest in the past 25 years. A small band of true believers has kept up the assault on capital theory orthodoxy until today, and from the company comes at least one of my co-editors. I shall call that loosely connected school the Anglo-Italian theorists. No simple name is ideal, but the one I have chosen indicates at least that the influences of Piero Sraffa and Joan Robinson, in particular, are of central importance. Even in that case, there is a flavor of necrophilia in the air. If one asks the question, what new idea has come out of Anglo-Italian thinking in the past 20 years? One creates an embarrassing social situation. This is because it is not clear that anything new has come out of the old, bitter debates. Meanwhile mainstream theorizing has taken different directions. Interest has shifted from general equilibrium style models to simple, mainly one good models. Ramsey style dynamic optimization models have largely displaced the fixed saving coefficient approach. The many consumers that Stiglitz implanted into an ear classical growth modeling did not flourish there. Instead the representative agent is usually now the model's driver. Finally, the exogenous technical progress of Harrod and most writers on growth from whatever school in the 1960s and later, has been joined by numerous models which make technical progress endogenous in one of the several possible ways. Dot 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 dot. Can the old concerns about capital be taken out, dusted down and addressed to contemporary models? If that could be done, one would hope that its contribution could be more constructive than the mutually assured destruction approach that marred some of the 1960s debates. It is evident that richer models yield richer possibilities. 
They do not do that in proportion when optimization drives model solutions. However, we know that many agent models can have multiple equilibria when all agents optimize. There may be fruitful paths forward in that direction. Old contributions should best be left buried when they involve using capital as a stick to beat marginal theory. All optima imply marginal conditions in some form. These conditions are part of an overall solution. Neither they nor the quantities involved in them are prior to the overall solution. It reflects badly on economists and their keenness of intellect that this was not always obvious to everyone. Conclusion Part of the problem in this debate revolved around the high level of abstraction and idealization that occurs in economic model building on topics, such as capital and economic growth. The original neoclassical models of aggregate growth presented by Robert Solow and Trevor Swan were straightforward, with simple results and uncomplicated conclusions which implied predictions about the real, empirical, world. The followers of Robinson and Sraffa argued that more sophisticated and complicated mathematical models implied that for the solo swan model to say anything about the world, crucial unrealistic assumptions must be true. To choose an example that did not get much attention in the debate, the solo swan model assumes a continuously attained equilibrium with full employment of all resources, contrary to Keynesian economics, saving determines investment in these models. The fact that the critique was also stated entirely using exactly the same kind of unrealistic assumptions meant that it was very difficult to do anything but criticize Solo and Swan. That is, Sraffian models were explicitly divorced from empirical reality, and as is very common in debates, it was much easier to destroy neoclassical theory than to develop a full-scale alternative that can help us understand the world. In short, the progress produced by the Cambridge controversy was from the unrealistic reliance on unstated or unknown assumptions to a clear consciousness about the need to make such assumptions. Assumptions. But this left the Sraffians in a situation where the unreal assumptions prevented most empirical applications, along with further developments of the theory. Thus it is not surprising that Bliss asks, what new idea has come out of Anglo-Italian thinking in the past 20 years? Even though Sraffa, Robinson, and others had argued that its foundations were unfounded, the solo swan growth model based on a single-valued aggregate stock of capital goods has remained a centerpiece of neoclassical macroeconomic sand. Growth theory it is also the basis for the new growth Growth theory, quote, in some cases, the use of an aggregate production function is justified with an appeal to a instrumentalist methodology and a need for simplicity in empirical work. Neoclassical theorists such as Bliss have generally accepted the Anglo-Italian critique of the simple neoclassical model and have moved on, applying the more general political economic vision of neoclassical economics to new questions. Some theorists such as Bliss, Edwin Burmeister and Frank Hahn argued that rigorous neoclassical theory is most appropriately set forth in terms of microeconomics and intertemporal general equilibrium models. The critics, such as Pierangelo Garagnani, Fabio Petri, and Bertram Schfold, have repeatedly argued that such models are not empirically applicable and that, in any case, the capital theoretical problems reappear in such models in a different form. The abstract nature of such models has made it more difficult to clearly reveal such problems in as clear a form as they appear in long period models. Since Samuelson had been one of the main neoclassical defenders of the idea that heterogeneous capital could be treated as a single capital good, his article conclusively showed that results from simplified models with one capital good do not necessarily hold in more general 
models. He thus mostly uses multisectoral models of the Leontief-Sraffian tradition instead of the neoclassical aggregate model. Most often, neoclassicals simply ignore the controversy, while many do not even know about it. Indeed, the vast majority of economics graduate schools in the United States do not teach their students about it. It is important, for the record, to recognize that key participants in the debate openly admitted their mistakes. Samuelson's seventh edition of Economics was purged of errors. Lavhari and Samuelson published a paper which began, We wish to make it clear for the record that the non-reswitching theorem associated with this is definitely false. We are grateful to Dr. Passanetti. Dot dot single quote dot. Leland Yeager and I jointly published a note acknowledging his earlier error and attempting to resolve the conflict between our theoretical perspectives. However, the damage had been done, and Cambridge, UK, declared victory. Lavhari was wrong, Samuelson was wrong, Solo was wrong, Mitt was wrong and therefore neoclassical economics was wrong. As a result there are some groups of economists who have abandoned neoclassical economics for their own refinements of classical economics. In the United States, on the other hand, mainstream economics goes on as if the control controversy had never occurred. Macroeconomics textbooks discuss capital as if it were a well-defined concept, which it is not, except in a very special one capital good world. The problems of heterogeneous capital goods have also been ignored in the rational expectations revolution and in virtually all econometric work.